Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I think we're going to try to get started. <laughs> I know I'm breaking with tradition here. Uh, we're starting early. So uh, uh, we turned over a new leaf. My name is David Harris. I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Am I live? Just barely. Um, so on behalf of uh, uh, Professor Brown Nagan and Dean Manning, I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School this afternoon. This is a, a very important event for us, and we're very excited to present the first of our dispatches from the front line of community justice. <clears throat> we're also grateful to have uh, our co-sponsors, the HLS uh, Urbanists and uh, the African American Mayors Association, and we really uh, deeply appreciate their support for this. Before we get started, I want to highlight a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, I've announced these before, but I, look, I encourage you to uh, keep, uh, keep track of, on, of our events on our website and through social media. Next week, on October 10th, we'll host a talk by Fordham professor uh, Tanya Hernandez on her book uh, on multiracials and civil rights. Uh, that'll be uh, at noon on October 19th. Our screening of uh, three and a half minutes has been postponed, for those of you who wrote it down before. But on October 25th, we will host a conference on forensic science, uh, co-hosted by ProPublica and the New York Times Magazine. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, moderated by our own Kate, uh, Katie Naples Mitchell. On uh, November 7th, uh, Johns Hopkins University professor Martha Jones uh, will present her book, uh, Birthright Citizen, which looks, takes a look back on uh, black civic engagement prior to the Civil War, uh, an often untold story. On uh, November 16th and 17th, along with the uh, Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, we will co-host a two-day conference on race, racism, and mental health. That'll also be here at both days. And we continue to hope to present uh, Get Out on uh, Halloween, but we'll have to wait and see how much support we're able to generate for that. Uh, so we can, by acclamation, decide to do it if you also so approve. So I want to get started with the program, but before I do that, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the goals of our project and what we mean when we talk about dispatches from the front lines of community justice. We at the Houston Institute have a major uh, programmatic undertaking called the Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice. This is a project that really stems from a recognition of the, the damage that has been done to our communities, particularly communities of color, by wars, by decades of the war on crime and war on drugs. One of the results of this uh, onslaught is that not only have our communities been underdeveloped and, uh, and in some ways neglected, but voices of those affected by policies have been diminished, if not silenced completely. We see our goal, <clears throat> the goal of our project, is to change the way public policy is conceived, uh, designed, and implemented such that the voices of the people affected by those policies uh, are at the center of their development. And typically, we do our events when we talk about dispatches from the front lines. We're talking about community-based organizations and individuals who are working in the trenches. We also recognize, however, that there are elected officials who are working in those trenches. Uh, there are people who are, are in positions of leadership who also subscribe to our notion of community justice, and we need to highlight their work as well. We're really fortunate to have two such people with us today, uh, Mayor Tony Harp from New Haven and Mayor Kevin Weaver from Flint, Michigan. Uh, both of them have uh, shown in, in their relatively short tenures uh, powerful voices for those in need, and we really uh, appreciate them taking the time out to be here with us today. I'm not going to dwell a lot on their, on their biographies because I think you'll learn a lot about them uh, from their comments today, and uh, I want us to get to that as soon as we can. <clears throat> We're also very fortunate to have with us today Jamie Pascal, uh, who is the social policy ad associate uh, <coughs> from our partner, uh, African American Mayors Association, and will moderate the panel today. And finally, as always, I have to give a big shout to Kelly Garvin, my colleague, who, like the Energizer Bunny, keeps churning out these events and posters, the great posters we have. Of course, she's not here, because I wouldn't <laughs> say it quite that way if she were here. Uh, <coughs> and then I also want to make an acknowledgment to uh, Isaac Gibbons, uh, who was a high school student who did his gap year with us last year and first brought Mayor Weaver to our attention uh, when we were trying to look at ways to improve the uh, contracting process and found uh, uh, the, the, the process that she had developed to uh, uh, create the contracts for the infrastructure in Flint uh, was something remarkable and something that we needed to know and understand. 
So Isaac is now uh, a, a student at UMass and very happily uh, getting ready for an exam tomorrow or he would have been here today. So with that, uh, no further ado, I want to give you Jamie Pascal to uh, lead our conversation today. Jamie. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for dispatches from the front lines of community justice mayoral panel. My name is Jamie Pascal, and I will be um, moderating this panel today. Oh. Is that <laughs> okay? Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Charles Hamilton Houston, Houston Institute and the HLS Urbanists for um, having us as a partner on this amazing event. Now more than ever, we are seeing federal government kind of take a back seat um, in terms of addressing some of the concerns of cities across the country. And we are seeing uh, mayors really bring forth um, innovative and powerful solutions. So joining me in the conversation today, we have two outstanding women mayors who are really leading the charge in their cities, Mayor Karen Weaver of Flint, Michigan, and Mayor Tony Harp of New Haven, Connecticut. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Um, so with our time today, we really want to get an understanding of what's it like to lead a city that's already facing ongoing challenges, despite, especially during um, times of challenges and crisis. Um, but before we do that, I want to go to the mayors and just go back in time a little bit to map out how you got into this role as mayor and how has your past experiences uh, prepared you, if at all, <laughs> um, for the great task of leading and advocating on behalf of your constituents? Either or. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, well, I'll go ahead and get started. And mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you this evening. But I didn't take, I, I had a very unusual role in becoming mayor because I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, I had not been involved in politics and someone asked me to volunteer on someone's campaign that was running for mayor. And I remember saying to them, well, I've never been involved in politics. And they said, well, you've got great administrative skills. We need you to help get this, get this person uh, in office. And I mm -hmm. said, well, I'll see how I like it. <laughs> and so I started volunteering uh, on a campaign. And actually, this man was running for mayor. And he was running against the person I ended up beating. <laughs> Uh, and so I started going there two or three times a week for two to three hours, and by the time it was over, I was there every single day because I saw what was going on in the city of Flint, and I wanted to be part of making a difference. So um, I remember, but then the emergency manager came in because they said, if he gets in, we're going to take you to City Hall with us, but he never got in because the emergency manager took over, and I just stayed involved and engaged. Mm -hmm. And then I began uh, talking with other mayors around the country. I, I'd sneak off to different workshops. I remember uh, National League of Cities was having a workshop. And I said, oh, I hope nobody from Flint is there because they'll wonder what am I doing here. Because <laughs> I, I decided I might run for mayor. And there were about 10 mayors that were there across the country. And I talked with them about issues and challenges we faced in Flint. And I kept doing those kinds of things. And OK, well. <laughs> I just ended fell up on you. <laughs> I ended up running after that a few, a few years later. Awesome. Uh, four years later, I decided I was going to run for mayor. But I do believe leadership experience was very uh, necessary, and it came in. And it didn't hurt being a psychologist with the issues and challenges we were facing in Flint. Absolutely. May I have? Sure. I uh, started out as uh, working for the city of New Haven. and. Um, I was a planner and all of my plans had to go before the Board of Alders, which is our town council. And uh, they had the ability to make changes to those plans that I'd worked so hard on. And I thought, well, oh, uh, I really need to be where the final decision is made. Mm -hmm. So after a while, I ran for Alder and um, became Alder. I served for five years and I realized that New Haven is, and Connecticut, they're very different in that. Um, property tax is the way in which you build your revenue. Mm -hmm. And we're a city that is 54% tax exempt. And so I knew that we had to get money from somewhere. We don't have county government in Connecticut. And so 
I thought, I've got to go to the state capitol so that I can get money to come back to my town because so much of what we need are resources to address our problems. And so I ran for state senate and I won and I then served in the state senate for, for 21 years. I really liked policy and that sort of thing. But one of the things that we worked on was this whole concept of results-based accountability. And it asked three questions. How much did you do? How well did you do it? And is anybody better off? And mm -hmm. I worked my way up to being the Senate chair of the Budget Writing Committee in Connecticut. We would send money back to New Haven, and I thought that money, as you remember, money was the main problem. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that it's not just money, but how you spend your money that mm -hmm. makes a difference. And every other time that I'd run, I'd run against an incumbent. When the mayor decided not to run again in New Haven, I decided to run. I learned by that time that any time a woman runs for a seat, an open seat, she has a 51% chance of being elected. And so um, I thought, well, okay, the chances are in my favor. And I want to see if with the same amount of resource, we can make a difference if there's more intention around how we spend the money. And so I ran and I won. <laughs> <laughs> now both Mayor Weaver and Mayor Harp um, are history makers. <laughs> they are actually the first African American women to lead both uh, New Haven and Flint. So I, I want to. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, let's cross that one. As women, how did you navigate breaking through both racial and gender barriers in these roles of uh, leadership? Because we often hear of women in executive positions sometimes having challenges that their male counterparts aren't privy to. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I think that after, it, just from my path that I took as an alder, then as a state senator, senator for so many years, I really never thought of myself as a woman politician. I thought of myself as probably the person who was most prepared to take over the leadership of, of our city. And so, um, and so I ran. I, it never occurred to me until much later that I would be the first woman in 375 years mm -hmm. to be mayor of one of the oldest cities in America. And so, um, so I, I didn't think about it, I just ran because I, I felt a sense of mission. And, uh, and it probably did make a difference, but I didn't focus on that while I was running. I have seen it make a difference once I became mayor, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, you're absolutely right. I was gonna say, my answer is very similar to that because I, I didn't focus on that, uh, that I would be the first female uh, ever elected for mayor of the city of Flint. And I remember people would ask me that when I was running, well, if you get in, do you realize? And I said, I have to get there. And so, I, and that was what I told them. I thought I was the best candidate and I happened to be female, but I really couldn't focus on uh, this will be history if you get in because mm -hmm. you had to get there first. And so it was interesting because afterwards they said, now what's it like? And I said, oh, now I have to have an answer. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't focus on that uh, while I was running because you'll get distracted if you focus on that and you're really looking at what is the goal that you're trying to achieve and the goal is I'm getting there to make a difference. And so that was, it was just interesting to listen to mm -hmm. you say that, because I said, wow, that was the same thing. It was very similar. Got it, awesome. So Mayor Weaver, I want to go to you first um, and go back to kind of the first day that you were in office after taking oath and just <laughs> walking around City Hall. Um, you get to your office, maybe you sit down, you clear some things off your table and you're handed um, the Flint water crisis on a silver platter. Um, and I want to talk about that because it became a national concern, um, but we're seeing that other cities are having that challenge too as far as old pipes and um, high, le high lead levels. Mm -hmm. So um, what can you tell us about the current state of the water crisis and how can the public support Flint's efforts um, if it's ongoing? Okay, uh, well I'll start with what you first talked about because mm -hmm. I was just having this conversation when I got into office. I didn't walk in like a normal mayor because we still had uh, the emergency manager in place. So I walked in office with no power. Okay. That's what they said. I could not appoint my staff. And so one of the things I decided to do was pretend I had power. 
and I went in and fired everybody. Mm -hmm. And they told me I had no power to do that, and I just told them, well, no, it's coming, because mm -hmm. I believe in home rule, and that's what I was fighting for. So I could not put uh, people in place. I couldn't appoint my, my uh, chief of police, my fire chief, my chief legal. I couldn't do any of those things. Okay. And so it was, I, I remember having a conversation with the governor and I told him, I said, well, governor, with the person you've put in as our chief of police, our homicide rate has gone up 70%. I said, and, you know, if you're okay with that, then okay. I'll go back and tell the people you're fine with that. And um, I said, and our fire chief got rid of our equipment. So if that dorm, that U of M dorm catches on fire and we can't get to the students, you know, if, if you're good, I'll go back and tell the people you're okay with that. And so he started letting me put, he said, okay, you can appoint your chief of police and your <laughs> fire chief. And so I started doing those kinds of things. So it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I did know going into it that there was a water crisis. But when I first started campaigning, our water issue was the cost of water okay. uh, because we were paying eight times the national average. So that was how the water crisis started when I declared I was running. That's what our issue was. And then while I was campaigning, we found out about the water and, and having uh, lead in our water. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so while I campaigned, I did say, that was one of the things I said I was going to do was, uh, when I got elected, I was going to declare an emergency for the city of Flint. And so I got elected in uh, November, and then in December I declared the emergency. And um, you know, it's really too bad because we've been talking about it for 18 months. We knew we had bad water and uh, nobody was listening. So when it became national attention, we've been dealing with it already for 18 months. Um, and so, anyway, I'll, I'll speed it up because we, you know, declared the emergency and we did get funding from the state and the federal government to start addressing the pipes. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say, I said, you know, people hear that you can't drink the water in Flint, but there's a reason that you can't drink it now that's different from the original reason. And, um, you know, because before it was flowing through all of our pipes. Well, because corrosion control was not put in the water, that's mm -hmm. what damaged the pipes, and so lead okay. leached into the water system. Once we got the money, oh, we started changing the pipes. And so we, what we did was we identified uh, where the lead and the galvanized pipes were. And so what our issue is and why we are still saying that we can't drink the water was we needed to get all of those pipes changed. We're about 85% through getting those lead and galvanized pipes changed. Uh, so we're on a good road. If you test the water, the water will test good. But the problem is uh, we can change all the pipes in the world and the water can be good, but because corrosion control was not put in, people's in-home fixtures have been damaged, the plumbing has been damaged. And so if it's still going through damaged, you know, your water faucet has been damaged, your ice maker in your, in your freezer has been damaged, the, the washing machine, your hot water heater, those appliances have been damaged. And so when we have homes that test high for lead, it's because the in-home plumbing has been damaged and the state has not corrected that issue. And the other thing is, uh, while you have the amount of construction going on that we have, the EPA has said you still have a physical health issue you still have to protect yourself when you have that much construction going on all around the city and you're pulling lead pipes out. And so until we get all of that resolved, we're still staying on bottled and filtered water. And that's what I'm going to continue to tell people to do actually until I have the medical community. Uh, and we're talking about uh, physicians, public health, and the scientists give us the thumbs up that it's okay now. So we are staying on bottled and filtered water until we get through this. You mentioned um, public health. I wanted to ask whether um, there were any additional areas that needed to be addressed now that the uh, water impacted people so heavily. Yes, you know, that was one of the things we said. Not only was it a water crisis, an infrastructure crisis, economic development, but public health. And we know that uh, actually all of the citizens have been impacted, but we knew pregnant women, uh, nursing moms, kids under the age of six, our seniors and people with compromised immune systems were most at risk. And uh, so one of the things we talked about was needing uh, like a chief public health advisor. And I remember I went and met with the Obama administration during that time. I said, we've got a public health crisis. And so he sent a team of people a medical staff to come and work with us for about six months and they said you need a medical person 
speaking on behalf of the city because if you remember when this crisis took place, we didn't trust the county because we weren't getting the information that we needed to get. They weren't speaking up for us. The state was not speaking up. The federal government, nobody was speaking up about what had happened. And so we did, you know, and we're still trying to work on reestablishing trust. And so that was a crucial position that we were able to get was a chief public health advisor, a recovery officer who goes out and talks to the community about what does recovery look like for your area. And uh, we also got, because we knew physical fitness was such a key component to uh, mitigating this lead, that we also got a, a recreation person as well to make sure we're doing things, um, you know, bringing parks back to, to the kids and making sure physical fitness is involved in what we're doing. But having a chief public health advisor, we look at health and all policies now. Mm. Okay. Great, awesome, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, so Mayor Harp, I wanted to talk about, recently uh, New Haven had an outbreak of K2 overdoses which required quick response from city's personnel, um, emergency personnel. What was the cause of the widespread overdoses and being that there were no reported deaths, how was the city able to manage that crisis? Well, the, oddly, the, I believe the crisis started because we have the most robust methadone uh, maintenance program in the state. There are over eight methadone clinics, individual clinics, that, and maybe a, two more that are owned by another clinic. And so in Connecticut, when they first started methadone, it was started in New Haven, and uh, through a relationship with um, the medical school, Yale's medical school, and the odd way in which particularly one of the larger clinics provides um, services, they don't have a waiting room for their, uh, their clients. And so people wait outside to be seen. And so you can go down the street uh, of, in front of that clinic, actually across the street because they won't let them wait in front of the clinic. They wait across the street before they can be seen. There can be 24 to 30 people out there waiting to be seen in the methadone clinic. And so what happens is these people become very vulnerable mm -hmm. to other people. It's also a wet methadone clinic, which means you can have a positive talk screen and uh, you will still be given methadone. And that you don't really start, you start one month uh, groups that are a half an hour long after uh, you've been there for several months and it never escalates up until you've been in methadone treatment for about three years. Um, the other problem, so you see these people out there waiting, they're coming from all over our state, but if you're familiar with Connecticut, uh, the Valley area, and because their treatment is paid for by Medicaid, uh, Medicaid pays for bus passes. The bus transfer station in New Haven is on the New Haven Green, which is the center of our city. And so while there isn't a physical bus transfer station there, it's where all the buses that are going from uh, to different parts of our city and our state meet and people transfer. So all of the people that are coming into New Haven to go to our methadone clinics meet on the New Haven Green to transfer, uh, to go to the clinic or they come back uh, to go home. And so in both of those places, because the buses don't run uh, every hour in the hour, we're a real small town, real small state, people have to wait sometimes for two and three hours. And that there again on the New Haven Green, people are vulnerable to people who sell or give away drugs. Now the interesting thing about the K2 incident was the person who provided those drugs, and I say provided them, did not sell them. They gave them to people. It was a, a, a drug that was manufactured by Pfizer that uh, was a uh, marijuana look-alike drug that they no longer pursued. Uh, interestingly, in our city, Pfizer has uh, its research facility, uh, which is adjacent to, um, to, to our medical school. Um, so you can just kind of put that over there and sort of think about that. 
as we looked at it further, we noticed that a lot of the people, and I would say 75% of the people, maybe 80% of the people who are on methadone are not duly diagnosed. But if you have a dual diagnosis, and I asked the director, well, what happens if someone says to you that they have a mental health diagnosis? How long does it take to get that person into treatment? And she said, oh, well, you know, we have, um, we have psychiatrists. I said, well, how long does it take for you to get that person into treatment? And she says, anywhere from four to six weeks. Well, the drug dealer is waiting for them before they come in and after they exit. And so, so many of these people are self-medicating. And if they don't get them right in front of the clinic, they get them on the New Haven Green. And so what happened was the um, person who was distributing this K2 um, gave it to people on the green. And the interesting thing, there were over 100 overdoses. And the reason that no one died is that we have, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Sandy Hook. It was where it's a, uh, uh, in Sandy Hook uh, Township, there was an elementary school that uh, was uh, the scene of mass, a mass murder event. And from that time on, that must have been seven or eight years ago, all the municipalities in Connecticut work on tabletop um, um, kinds of things so that they can recognize. One of the things they recognized during Sandy Hook was that you had fire, you had police, you had ambulances, you had hospitals. None of them could communicate with each other. Uh, that was seven years ago. They were all on different uh, bands. And so uh, over the years, we've gotten money from the state, across the state, to work through all of those. And then we do uh, these tabletop demonstrations to try to determine where the problems are. So we've been doing this for seven years. And so there is a really good connection between police, fire, our, our ambulance um, department, and our hospital. So we were able to get out on the green, coordinate, and get people to the hospital right away. What is remarkable about this is that there were, were a few people who overdosed five times, five times, so that they would go to the hospital, they would come back out, and they would, to the green, get more of this stuff as we were trying to run it down, and overdose again five times. And so, um, at the hospital, when we tried to, our, our police tried to figure out, well, who gave this to you? What is it? People wouldn't give us their names because mm -hmm. they said that was the best blah, blah, blah I've ever had in my life. And so what uh, it said to us is, yes, uh, we didn't lose a life, but we have a very broken mm -hmm. uh, system of care for these people that can only come. In Connecticut, they've identified about five or six cities that can provide methadone. They have not allowed it to expand throughout the state. And so as a result, the expansion's been in New Haven. We were the first, and so that's why we have so many. And then we have all of these folks coming, but there isn't a good, and we have a robust service delivery system. But what we discovered was there was terrible coordination um, between the mental health system and the behavioral. Uh, the substance uh, addiction system, and that w what we're working on now is how do we fix those connections, and so we are in the process of doing that. Understood. So connected to other cities in May, uh, Weaver, feel free to jump in if you feel applicable. Um, the opioid epidemic has become a major concern as well nationwide. Um, last month, the Trump administration announced disbursing over $1 billion in grant funding to combat opioid addiction. From what happened in New Haven, are there any preventative measures that you think that city should have in place um, when we're thinking about these situations? Well, you know, one of the things that we've got to remember is that oftentimes, if there is a, a substance use problem, that there may be underlying mental health problems, and that you have to have a way to address both. You can't just 
uh, do drug replacement therapy and assume that that's going to work if you're not really thinking about, well, what are the other underlying causes? And, and, and what we know people will do is self-medicate. And so if you see that a certain part of your population is doing that, you would self-medicate. But what I think is that the federal government forces all of us as cities, as providers, to use this one model to provide treatment to people who are addicted to, to opioids. You have to have in, be in these big clinics. You have to go every day and get your methadone. Well, we have medical doctors who have um, our, our specialists in addiction. They can't practice from their offices. Why not? And so one of the things that I would recommend is that we take a look at the service delivery system and allow doctors to prescribe methadone and treat from their office as long as they have a system of care that takes care of all of the concerns that we have and that it's distributed throughout a state and it's not just in five or six different places. That's what I would recommend. Would you like to add anything? No, I don't have okay. anything to add. No problem. As you're charged with ensuring communities um, not only function but thrive, what are ways in which you've had to come up with innovative solutions to some of the problems that you faced? And Mayor Weaver, well, I'll start know, with you. Um, we had one of the things I was talking about earlier was I was saying not only was it a water crisis, public health crisis, but it made for an economic development crisis for the city of Flint. We were starting to see some changes happening before that hit and once we had the water crisis everything stopped and so one of the things we always know is that as a result of a crisis economic opportunities come and we wanted to make sure that when that happened that the people of the city of flint and then genesee county were going to be the ones that benefited from that even if you talk about when the uh, national guard came in to distribute water they were getting paid $2 million a month to do this. And we thought, we've got nine, we had uh, 18 to 24 year olds that weren't in school and didn't have jobs. They can hand out water and get paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started you know, hiring our people right from the city of Flint mm -hmm. to do that. And we also had them at the land bank packaging up the, um, the, the food, the fresh produce and fruits that uh, we needed to mitigate the lead. So we uh, started employing the, the people that didn't have jobs, young people that weren't employed or, or in school to do that. And so that was how we started. We also knew it was important that they did get a skill. So it was about more than just handing out the water and packaging up the food. Uh, so we, when we got the contractors, we put them with contractors at, through an apprenticeship program so they would learn something, get a skill, and get paid while that was going on. Uh, because we wanted to make sure they could be a contributing member uh, in their community or if they chose to go someplace else, they would have a skill that no one could take from them. But even when it came to putting in the, the uh, lead service lines or pulling them out, one of the things we wanted to do, and people were always uh, fearful that these big companies would come in because that's usually what happens is big companies from outside of the city, outside of the county come in and they get the contract. And we didn't, we, we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you look at how you're doing procurement in the city. That was something we knew we could do. And so, you know, we could have put out a contract. Okay, we need a company that can do tw uh, 28,000 lead service lines, 18,000, whatever. Uh, but we knew if we did it that way, none of the local companies could bid on that. And we knew no minority companies could bid on that. And so what we did, we were, you were talking about being very purposeful and intentional when you make certain decisions on how money is spent. And that was what I wanted to do, is be very intentional about that. And so we broke them up into zones around the city and we made them smaller. So that way, companies right from the city of Flint can, could get those bids. And so when we started, we started with three companies. Two were from the city of Flint uh, and, and one was from Genesee County. And one company, it was the first time in the city of Flint that we'd had an African-American company ever get a multi-million dollar contract. Uh, and I thought, wow, I'm excited that we've been able to do this. But 
Really, it was 2016, and this was the first time something like that had happened. Uh, because they would always say, well, you, you can't do it that way. And I said, no, we can do it that way, and we're going to do it that way. Uh, because I said, the last thing that's going to happen is not a, we're going to have a crisis, and we're not going to benefit economically? I don't think so. And so we're going to look at how these bids go out. And um, one of the things we talked about was making sure you're hiring people from the city of Flint. And uh, so those were some of the things that we had conversation with them about and we put that in place is you, you've got to hire some workers from this city. You have to do that. And um, they also uh, were willing to give people second chances that had records because that was a big barrier as far as people being able to get jobs. So we were very intentional about uh, putting bids out where we knew local companies could could uh, you know actually have a chance to, to bid on those and get those contracts. Mm -hmm. And even when we moved to the next phase, we were doing the same kinds of things. We wanted to make sure that was what was going to happen, was we were going to hire our own people because we should be part of, because this is a healing process that we're going through as well. And we need to be part of the healing process and repairing our own community. And even the, like we had Lear Corporation and they, and it's not Lear the Jets, it's Lear that does the uh, car seats for the Chevy trucks. And they came and put a factory in, but one of the things we talked to them about was, you gotta hire people from Flint. And so they were hiring, uh, the goal is 650 people. And we said, okay, uh, 150 you can bring from other places, but we need those other people to be Flint residents and then Genesee County. And those are the kinds of things we have been putting in place. You know, and, and you have to look at the, the procurement process. They'll put things in there like, oh, they need to have a crane to be able to do this job. Well, that job, you don't need a crane to do that. But there are things that are put in there to keep local businesses and small businesses from being able to have that opportunity. And uh, so we had to look at those kinds of things. Why is that in there? You have to have this much uh, to be able to be bonded. Well, the job isn't that much. So why do you need that much? And, but they, you know, and you, you will hear, well, that's how it's always been. Well, okay, well, that's not how it's going to be. Okay. And you can, it's nice to be in a position where you can uh, implement those things and um, make those kinds of changes. Absolutely, and for you, Nick? Sure, when I uh, was first elected that November, I wasn't really sworn in yet, right? Right after, maybe two weeks after I was elected, uh, one of the young men in our high school was, was gunned down. Um, and I, I talked to the superintendent and I said, well, what do you think about that? And he said to me what every superintendent throughout my public life has said, I could have told you that kid was going to mm -hmm. be killed. I'm like, okay. Uh, Dr. So-and-so said that, Dr. So-and-so said that, and now you've said that. So tell me who's going to be next in our community and what are we going to do about it? And so he couldn't really tell me who was going to be next. He could say, well, you know, I think there are a number of qualities that these young people have. They're uh, overage and undercredited. They're DF students. Uh, they." Um, create a ruckus in school um, and um, don't come to school often. And so I said, um, how can we prevent the next person from being, being killed? And he really didn't really have any ideas. So what I did, and I think this is what mayors do. Mayors have the uh, ability, the path, this is I think, it, one of the superpowers of a mayor, somebody who is in public office, and that is the power to convene. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can bring people to the table to think about an idea. And so what I did was bring all of our high school principals. Um, we have someone named Dr. James Comer who does developmental work uh, with the child study. We brought him to the table. We brought our police, our fire chief. We brought uh, a number of people to the table and we said, let's think about this issue and think about what it is that we need to do. Now we're a city that's done community-based policing for a number of years and it's been very successful and we have something called ComStat every Thursday, which means that we look at all the crime across our city uh, by district and we try to figure out 
uh, what we've been good at stopping and what still is a problem. And so as we talked about it, some of the, uh, the principals thought there were kids that were really in trouble. So then we worked with our social service delivery system to actually get a couple of families out of town because our goal was not to have any more, any more deaths. Then we thought, well, why don't we use the model of ComStat, uh, which is sort of using data to try to figure out, well, who are these kids that have these five or six indicators um, and by school? And then why don't we train the truancy officers and the other support staff to work with these young people? In the meantime, the teachers had gone, we were an American Federation of Teachers school system, and they were doing restorative practices, which meant that, they, that we were all learning how to handle things uh, in the school rather than using expulsion. So we put all of that together, utilizing data, and we meet on a weekly basis now. Uh, and we have identified the young people, we've wrapped services around them, we've given them mentors, and by doing that over the past four and a half years, almost five years, we have, since we've done that, in every school that we've been in, we started in high schools, we're now going into middle schools, we haven't lost one kid. Um, in doing that, awesome. and working with the police, and working with focused deterrence, from 2011, seems like a long time, we've reduced our homicide rate by 69%. By doing that, we've reduced uh, our, um, our non-fatal victims, uh, shooting victims, by 54%. By doing that, and we know this is, is relatively uh, the fact, we have something called shot spotter that is in two-thirds of our city because people weren't, they weren't calling when shots were fired in their communities. So this automatically uh, triangulates the, the sound of the bullet, can tell us what the caliber is, and within five feet let us know where uh, the person, the bullet has been fired. The, on their cell phones, which we gave police officers, they can, within five feet, find that expended shell. So, the number of shots fired in our city has declined 78%. And so, by convening, by pulling together the resources, most of which already existed, by using data, we have um, reduced the number of, the, the amount of youth violence in our city, and certainly the number of deaths. Uh, we're keeping kids in school. Probably in 2011, we had a graduation rate of about 68%. And for some urban districts that are like ours, that are majority minority districts, that's not bad. So we've gone up to almost 80%. Mm -hmm. Because what we do is wrap those services around these young people who are going to be most disengaged. But beyond that, um, we don't allow the, the, the principals to expel kids. And around 2011, we were expelling about 89 uh, kids a year. Now, there are going to be some kids that need to be expelled. We're now down to about 14. And it's made a huge difference in our community. It's made it a lot safer. And it's also given these young people an opportunity to see, one, that we value them. And we've wrapped services and programs around them. And for those that we know are not gonna go on to college, it's our goal. We always say we're gonna prepare kids for college, career, and life. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of kids are not gonna go to college. Uh, not right away, maybe they will when they're 30, mm -hmm. after they've taken care of some of the business they didn't take care of. Um, but we've, we've, we've noticed a real interesting problem. Our uh, labor unions, uh, what you used to be able to see is that these jobs would be passed down from father to son. Uh, the kids don't want to do it anymore, and so they're looking for people that they came to us, to our school district, and said, we tried the state uh, uh, technical schools. They didn't want us. Will you take us? So now we're doing pre-apprenticeship programs for these young people uh, in our schools. We don't have a lot of uh, technical work in our high schools, so we have a state technical system we, um, 
worked with the, tech, the state technical system to say, well, when you're not in session after three o'clock, uh, can we use your resources? And so we have a program in their building using their resources and the teachers that want to make overtime to provide for these young people who are not going to go to college. And so if you are intentional and you sort of use the ability to convene and figure out what's missing in your system, then you can, you can make a difference. And it, and it doesn't require anything other than pulling people together to think about an issue. That's awesome. Uh, we often hear of, and before I turn the floor over for questions, we often hear of your successes as we are right now, which is awesome. But were there any setbacks um, that you ran into as it pertains to either crisis or just being a mayor in general? And how did you overcome those uh, setbacks? There are, there are always setbacks. <laughs> I mean, there, there are, and mm -hmm. you have to just really be determined. And um, sometimes you say, I'm not going to take that for an answer. Uh, I remember when I was going to declare the emergency, I was told not to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, like I said, the governor, all of his people were still running City Hall, basically. I was told not to declare an emergency because I was going to make the governor angry. And I said, well, we're already angry with him. So, <laughs> and then they, <laughs> like, we can't drink the water. We're mad. <laughs> so that's not going to stop me. Uh, they told me I was doing everything the wrong way. I remember c convening a meeting. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you're doing everything the wrong way. And I said, well, it got all of you all at the table. So I'm going to keep doing it this way. And uh, I remember they said, well, you'll only get $5 million. I said, well, right now we have zero. I'll take it. Uh, but we ended up getting much more than the state or the federal government ever expected we would get. We haven't gotten what we deserve, but sometimes it's, I'm not taking that as an answer. Or when people tell you, we've always done it this way, it can't be different. Well, it can be. You have to sit around and think about how you're going to do it differently. I remember them even saying, uh, because with an emergency manager, all of our assets have been sold. They sold our, we used to sell water, they sold our pipe. They sold our, our garbage trucks, they sold our, our um, lawnmowers, they sold our parks, they sold our, the airport, they sold, you know, all of the assets of the city. And I remember them saying, you'll never get your pipe back. And I said, well, you know, watch me try. Mm -hmm. And we did get our pipe back. It took a lot of people, it took a lot of hours sitting around that table and arguing, but being determined that you can do it. Uh, they said we would never get back on, right, we were, uh, getting our water from Detroit. They said, well, you can't go back. You can go back, you know, I mean, you can go back, but you have to, really, you have to be persistent and you have to have the stamina and you, you have to surround yourself with, with people that have that same vision and that same mission and that same determination to make those things happen. So there are always setbacks um, and you look at, okay, how am I, you, you keep getting up and, and sometimes you get tired. <laughs> I know you get tired. I remember during the crisis, it was, it was tough. Uh, and I thought, why am I doing this sometimes? And I remember I was in a grocery store and, and, and an older lady came up to me and she came and she said, this lady keeps looking at me. And she came and she hugged me and she said, thank you. And it gives you the energy. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's why I'm doing this. And so it gave me the energy to say, let me go back in there and try this again. And then the next day, it, it happened again. Somebody came up and said, you know, thank you for thinking about us and being a voice for us. And those are the kinds of things that they give you the energy and the desire and the drive when you, when you get tired. Because, because you do sometimes, you, sometimes you feel like you're fighting an uphill battle. But when you have those kinds of things happen, you're like, yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it, and you keep going. Okay. But, but you do have to keep in mind, there are gonna be obstacles, there are gonna be challenges and setbacks, and um, a lot of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Setups for major comebacks. <laughs> well, you know, we're a Connecticut city, and um, as I said, I was uh, the Senate chair, budget writing chair. And I thought, well, as long as we get the same amount of money that we get now, we'll be in good shape. Well, we didn't, you know, like, and as you heard, you know, it's really important that we do things for kids. Uh, last year, they um, eliminated the, um, our, our work program for, for young people across the state. But I knew I couldn't afford to eliminate the work program and, and have uh, 
kids not have summer jobs and that yeah. sort of thing. And so I didn't have it in my budget and it was uh, stressful, but I said, you know, look, we're gonna have to pay for it anyway. And let's hope our legislature, they are supposed to have a budget before the first uh, Wednesday of the first Monday in June. They didn't have a budget until um, sometime in October, so almost two, we were in the middle of the second quarter. And uh, in Connecticut, we don't have county government. The legislature r restricts the way that we can raise revenue to property taxes. I said once before, 54% uh, of our property is tax exempt. We absolutely depend upon getting the payment in lieu of taxes that comes from the state. So not only did they not fund our our youth work program that we counted on for years, they reduced our 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 pilot. A lot of our school funding comes from the state. They re, they reduced all of that by about nine point four million dollars. In a big city, that might not matter. But in our city, it mattered. I ended the budget in the red by about $8 million. Mm -hmm. I had to propose a budget that increased taxes. Um, and so, you know, like every time I say something or do something now, major setback, people are saying, but you raised our taxes. And so, uh, but it had to be done if we were going to um, really maintain our commitment of service to the people of New Haven. And um, so we are struggling with that as we speak to try to help people understand that there, it's got to come from somewhere. And if you can't get it, I, I did go to Yale and I said, um, look, we need, uh, for, they do a voluntary pilot. I said, we need more money from you. They said, okay. Um, if you will agree to us taking more money off the tax rolls, we'll give you another $2 million, which I think was 2.6, which they did. But they, what they failed to tell me was they were going to take over $120 million worth of property off of the tax rolls. And it's like, I don't know, I think we're going to have to renegotiate that one. And so uh, just trying to get through all of this, understanding that our legislature up at the state, and we're absolutely dependent upon them because they only give us one way to raise revenue, um, is dominated by suburban towns. It makes it really, really difficult. And so um, we are struggling with that as I speak. But we will do the best we can to get around it and to help people understand that you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we look forward to you overcoming it. Um, at this time, I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Uh, I think David has a mic, if anyone has any questions. Yep. Oh, okay, sure. Does anyone have any questions? All righty. All righty, well, I have I one do. last question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> David, you have the floor. Yes, I have this. Uh, uh, Mayor Harp, I, I have to say that in getting ready, I was kind of looking over the election results from your, your campaigns. And I, and I noticed that, that with each campaign, uh, you get more and more of the electorate. You get more and more. Your, your margins become bigger and bigger, which is very impressive. Uh, so, I mean, an interesting question is, to the extent that that happens, that means that something must be going right in terms of the way you're able to communicate with your constituents. But I also wonder in terms of, Who's paying taxes? I mean, whether the people, you know, the, the people who are complaining about the taxes going up, and you know, can you talk a little bit about the, the, what you do, both of you actually, in terms of the, the kinds of uh, the ways in which you engage with your community and your constituents, and and and, and what what role that plays in, in your electoral success? Well, one of the things that I do, and I, and I'm certain that almost every mayor does, but I think women mayors do this more, is that we engage in everything. I'm a 24-7 mayor. Mm -hmm. I, I never get home before, you know, like nine o'clock at night. Uh, not, not on the weekends, but I, every one of my weekends is dedicated to some other group in, in my community. I've been working with the ministers of our town because um, they've wanted to be a part of this, what do we do about this opioid crisis? And so we're going to have a day of prayer. So I've been working with them to do something like that. But um, 
we are divided into 10, maybe 12 management teams so that we're divided in that way. I'm going to take my story about our, about why and how we've raised taxes in our town and what people are getting for that. I'm taking it out to the people. So I think it's, we're, we're geographically small. It's easy to get uh, to people. And, and I think it's really important that you make yourself available to the people in your town um, so that you can hear them, their unhappiness about what you're doing, which isn't fun. But you can also hear those wonderful, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> every now and then there's somebody who thinks you're doing something right. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, because you do have to be very hands-on and accessible and go a lot of different places and work with a lot of different groups. And I do work with the pastors a lot as well because because their congregations listen to them. And so it's good to have them as voices and advocates in the community and carrying your message and explaining to them why you're doing certain things. So they've been a big part of what's been going on in Flint. But it is hard. It was especially hard to say, why are you paying for water you can't use? Uh, and, and talking to people about that, having that conversation. So one of the things I was able to negotiate, it didn't, it didn't, it lasted about a year, but it helped was uh, when we could, you know, when it first started, I asked for credits for people. And so we got credits so they didn't have to pay, but we said we could use it, we were using the sewer portion. So just pay your sewer portion. Well, you know, the credits lasted for about a year and then they went away. Uh, and that was why it was really so important because they said, well, if we just wait long enough, those pipes will recoat. We're not waiting for pipes to recoat. We want new ones. And uh, people, I'm not asking people to pay a water bill and you don't have new pipes. How much sense does that make? And so it was people needed to see new pipes going in the ground. We deserve to have new pipes going in the ground. Uh, but explaining to them, we were between a rock and a hard place because we had been taken over by an emergency manager. So it's you've been dealt a, a bad hand, so how do you play a bad hand well? And it was explaining to people, we're changing the pipes and the water is getting better and we're doing these other things to help, and, but we've got to help ourselves. So if we don't start paying, because that we, that's how we get our, our revenue is from the water bill and the taxes. That, that's where the money comes from. And so if we're not putting money in there, well, the state's just waiting to come back and take over. And so it was, so which way do we want to go? Do we want to, yeah, we're going to pay even though we're not all, all the way completed with uh, replacing the pipes. But if we don't pay, we know that they're just hovering around waiting to take us back over. Uh, and, and we didn't want that to happen. And that was worse than being, uh, you know, having our own city back. That was worse than having your own city back, was having a dictator in place and having somebody not from your community making decisions for you and about you, and then they drive home, you know, 40 miles away, 60 miles away, those kinds of things. And so it was telling people, no, I'm not excited about this, but these are the two choices, and if we want to be a self-sustaining city again, and start uh, letting people know that we are worth the investment and we are doing these things. I mean, it's hard to ask for help if you don't help yourself as well. And so it was having those kinds of conversations and people were very angry about it for a long time. Some still are. And, and understanding that, but saying, here's why we have to do that. Uh, and and uh, more and more people, as we've continued to go, more and more people are understanding, but they're also seeing that Wow, 85% of the pipes have been replaced, so it was still making sure we were doing those kinds of things as well uh, to, to help balance that and let them know we are taking this seriously, we are uh, going to address this, but we still need you to help financially. We need you to pay the water bill. Okay, we have uh, one question here with the gray sweater. Thank you. Um, you talked about, um, both of you talked a little bit about the difficulty of, of raising revenue uh, when it's based on property taxes um, and with, without a lot of state aid. Um, is it, uh, how does sort of, um, 
raising the property value in order to um, get more tax revenue. Is that, is that a realistic or helpful strategy or is it too hard to square with your other uh, policy goals? Well, I was going to say, for me, it's not something that's realistic at this point in time, uh, just because I just got people paying for water again. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and right now, one of our arguments is still, we are paying eight times the national average for water, and that's a big problem for us, and we know that our rates were raised illegally under an emergency manager. And so we haven't been able to, to do that. Uh, and, and that was one of our other arguments was as a result of the water crisis, property values went down. We lost population. And so the revenue we had coming in, some of that was gone as well. And so that's why it was so important for us to really address the water issue because we were trying to attract companies and bring back, you know, have economic opportunities in the city of Flint. And they had to see that we were taking care of the water first. And so we've really just focused on that and making sure we're providing as many economic opportunities for people as possible. And that part has really been picking up for the city of Flint, and that's been going well. Um, uh, you know, we just got uh, a, a grant from HUD for $30 million for new housing and, and for blight. Uh, the, you know, and if it had not been for the water, our biggest concern, like you talked about, would have been public safety. Uh, that's usually our number one issue is public safety, but uh, the water crisis hit us, and so we've been able to address those other things. So people are seeing the improvements that are happening, and so now we're really focused on making sure economic opportunity is available for the people of the city of Flint, so that's where we focused right now. So in New Haven, um, before I became mayor, there was a, a real interest to develop New Haven and to get developers in to build apartments, um, housing, uh, commercial. And so our, our council, the Board of Alders, uh, passed a tax break that basically was to entice developers to come in into town. And so if you come in and you build new or you do major uh, renovation, then it takes about seven years for you to pay um, your, the regular tax rate. And it made a lot of sense at the time because they, uh, the city really needed development. It needed to, uh, new economic blood, but they weren't gonna come into what was a depressed city without getting some kind of tax break. And so now, um, over the past, since I've been mayor, uh, we've had a building boom, and I keep seeing these buildings go up in my first budget. I said, this is great. We have this new apartment building. Uh, I know we have new revenue. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. my assessor and my finance guy said, oh, no, we don't. Uh, we'll get it in another six years. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. Uh, so what we're doing now is taking a look at changing that. Um, our development people still say that we need to have some uh, way to entice people to come into our city, but we're going to try to make some changes so that our payback is a little sooner than seven years. Mm -hmm. But um, we're great development, it looks really good. It's just going to take a long time before we actually see that uh, in our coffers. And I think that's something that urban cities face right. uh, because you've been dealing with those kinds of issues. And so you are trying to, okay, what can we do to get them to come? Right. And so they do get those kinds of deals because you know it pays off, but it doesn't pay off immediately. immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is, it, that's a tough one. It is. It's a tough one. I know one of the other things we've done is just like I said, Lear Corporation came in. We said, well, we need some playgrounds in Flint. Uh, you know, last year we put three new ones in. This year our goal was six. And then they said, well, we're going to give you two more. So we're, you know, I mean, we're, we're doing those kinds of things because we know that um, there are certain things you have to do and have in place to keep families and attract families and keep businesses and bring new ones in. And so we're doing those kinds of things. But when you said that, I thought, yeah, I know mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to hear from both of you. You guys are so brave. <laughs> <laughs> so my, I have one question for you in, in, in Flint. Um, if right now, I know you have probably over 10,000 kids or maybe more that has been affected with, with lead. 
and I know that is a, there's a problem for the future, it could be. Uh, what is the initiative that's been thinking created or anything right now for this future? That is one of the questions. For both of you is how can we from outside help uh, to alleviate some of this? Is there any ways that people from outside, what would be, even if it's the dream thinking, what it is that, that uh, outsiders could help? Okay, you are, you are asking what we have in place for the kids? Okay, and let, me, and let me say, because I don't want people to forget, we know the kids were our first priority in addressing the lead crisis, but we did have some people that died as a result of this as well. Uh, we, we lost about, thir we, we know 13 people died as a result mm -hmm. of Legionnaires, but we had a, a higher rate of pneumonia where people died, and they're thinking that really may have been Legionnaires that had not been diagnosed. And another thing was we we know our rate of, uh, of stillbirths and miscarriages went up during this time. So we, you know, we, we don't know the human cost of this yet. It's real easy to put out, you know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars for infrastructure, but as far as the human cost, that's what we keep telling them. We don't, we, we can't put a price on that because some things we may not even know yet. We may see that these kids, well, okay, they look like they're okay, but then five years from now, they've developed some kind of physical health problem. And so there is, you know, there's some of the money that has been donated that is, and let me say right now, that money went to the foundations, not to the city of Flint, <laughs> because everybody thinks we got all these millions and millions of dollars, and what did we do with it? Well, we didn't get it. We got money for pipes. Uh, so, the, but money went to foundations and it's set up for those kinds of things because we know that it's a health crisis. We know that physical health is going to be impacted. We know mental health, you know, you're talking about the issues with mental health. We know that the juvenile justice system will be impacted, the foster care and adoption, uh, you know, when you look at special education. So all of those things are gonna be happening with, with the kids. We know that we're, you know, we're poisoned with this lead water. And so one of the first things we did, and it's not enough, is we didn't have, we had one uh, school nurse for the whole district, which made no sense. So we do have school nurses in all of the schools now. Uh, so that was something. Uh, we're, we're putting the mental health services back in the schools because we really were understaffed when you talk about mental health services in the schools. Those are some of the things we did. Ex we got the Medicaid expanded up to age 21 and for all pregnant women. So that's in place. So we have some things in place, but I'm sure it's not nearly enough because, like I said, we don't know some of the issues and challenges that not only that the kids are going to face, but that some adults may be facing. Uh, we didn't find out about the, the rate of the stillbirths and miscarriages until a year later uh, when they were doing research. That's when that came up. We didn't find out about the pneumonia until later when they said we lost 13 people to Legionnaires. Um, and, then, and then we're finding out some of these things because it takes time to look at all of the data. So while there's some things in place, that's one of the things we've talked about is having something set up for much longer than what we have and needing more, uh, you know, more financial resources because we don't know everything we're going to face. So those are some of the things that have been put in place, but I I'm sure more is going to be needed. You know, I had a son, I have a son who um, was, a, he, he was a, oh, you know, an average student in high school kind of the first two years of college was an average student. And one day I picked him up from college and he said, Ma, the law is awesome. And then he went on to tell me about how all the advances that we've made in, environment, in the environment in our country had to do with law, the law. And uh, so what I would say, Ma, we're in a law school. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're suing the pharmaceutical companies for the way in which they handle the opioids. Well, what about K2? And what about a lot of these things that they have patented, they're no longer gonna use, but are open source for people to use to, uh, sort of the mad scientists to use to uh, abuse all of us. Is there not a lawsuit there somewhere? And is there not a way to think from a policy point of view what you do about that sort of thing? Um, and it would seem to me that a place like this and other of our eminent schools of law should be thinking about 
How do we go to that next level to protect the citizens of Flint, to protect the citizens of New Haven that have had to deal with people doctoring things mm -hmm. that they got through a legitimate process? And uh, so I would ask you to use the skills that you're learning here to figure out how to make uh, the system more accountable to people so that we don't have to pick the pieces up on the streets of our cities. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other thing, you, you also talked about what you could do to help. People need to know the importance of local and state elections. They really do. Uh, I know in Flint, our numbers were low. Mm -hmm. People, you know, they'd go and vote when it was time for the president, but it's like, you know what? Do you know what is determining most of your day-to-day -day life? Is your local politics and, and your state. And, and, and making sure people are engaged in that uh, because they just weren't, they just weren't. And the other thing, I, I hope people are learning from what happened in Flint. I said, I sure would hate for us to go through a crisis and nobody learn from Flint. Uh, don't, don't let us go through what we've been through and, and, and not be a voice for you. Don't take water for granted, water quality standards, don't. Uh, it's important and we're telling people even as we're changing pipes continue to get your water tested uh, People need to know the importance of investing maintaining and investing in infrastructure uh, Because it's been neglected and Flint's not the only place that's having these challenges and uh, What happened in Flint ours was different because it was man-made But it what happened in Flint can happen someplace else and so I hope people are challenging that and looking at the standards because what's in place uh, is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And even though we're uh, changing some of the, uh, the lead and copper rule for, the, for uh, the state and it will be the lowest in the nation, it's still too high. You know, we're, they're going from 15 parts per billion to 12. Uh, I don't know, that's not good. Uh, it's testing better than that. But know that, you, that your voice will make a difference and speak up and keep these stories out there mm -hmm. and, and educate people, use social media and whatever else you can to let people know what's going on. And um, we've told people if you're looking at urban, urban communities uh, that there are, Flint, there are Flints all across the country. There are Flints all across the country. So it's one of the things I've said is use us um, as a lesson, use us for advice and, and technical assistance and guidance uh, and, and, and speak up and, and just don't take things for granted. Um, okay, so my name is Chidera, um, and I'm an AmeriCorps Fellow at the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee. Thank you both for coming. Um, so I would want to ask more substantive policy questions, but I'm just celebrating the fact that you two are, you know, very powerful women of color in highly visible roles. And so I have two questions related to that. The first is, um, uh, what advice uh, would you give um, to, women, to women of color who aspire to enter public office? And one thing I've already learned from what you've both said at the beginning um, is being intentional about what you're doing in life and um, when you're intentional then the opportunity opportunities will line up but I wonder if there's anything else that you you any of the advice that you'd give and then the second thing is um, do either of you plan to run for national office <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think the most important uh, thing to remember is that women win 51% of the time. And so what I would say to you is find a way to get into the political system in the area in which you live. Uh, you can do it anyway. You can be, if they have ward committees, you can volunteer for the ward, ward committees. But get in there, start working, get known, do the jobs nobody else wants to do, but also make sure you get credit for doing those jobs. And then work your way into the system and get support for your ideas, and then run. And don't think about the fact that you're a woman, you're somebody who wants to make a difference for your community. That's what you should think about, mm -hmm. as Mayor Weaver thought about. Mm -hmm. Because uh, people don't really, as much as you want to think that they do, I think sometimes women count themselves out more than others count women out. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say don't be scared. 
<laughs> don't be scared. And we do. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I thought about it, I might have put up some of the biggest barriers for myself. Uh, because I hadn't been, like I said, I hadn't been involved in politics. So who am I to say, okay, well, I'm going to run for mayor. Uh, and, and so I said, is that something I should do? You know, I, that's not the experience that I've had. Uh, you know, I know mental health. I'm just like, that's what I do. Uh, and so you start putting barriers up for yourself. And um, fortunately, you know, there were people that I, whose advice and wisdom I trusted and I went and talked with them and, and had a lot of conversation with them and, and my family, of course. But it was, and, and I think I was doing what you said because mm -hmm. even though I hadn't had that kind of experience, it was, well, I'm gonna go over here and see what they're doing and talk with them and then I'm gonna go over here and see how did they handle this and what would you suggest for that? And so those were the kinds of things I was doing. Um, and, and then I remember when, when other people said, well, you don't have experience. I said, well, the people that had experience told us to drink the water. And they didn't <laughs> tell us it was bad. So, I mean, you can have bad experience or <laughs> we can go this way. <laughs> so so don't, be, don't be scared and don't count yourself out. Please don't do that. Hi. This one? Thank you both for being here. Mayor Harp, I was curious, you mentioned a couple of things that are characteristic of urban planners, and I'm studying urban planning in full disclosure, but um, the transportation network and the role of the bus stop, the space in the methadone clinic, um, the power of convening, that superpower. I was just curious, now that you're on this side of things as mayor, how did your planning background inform that? or? Um, now that you're on this side, what do you wish that aspiring planners knew? Well, I, I really, since I really just went to planning school and never really did much planning at all, except early, early in my career, um, at first I didn't think that it had much, it played much of a, a role. But one of the things that we're doing, I, I didn't talk about this, we're, we're doing this thing called clean and safe neighborhoods, and so we're doing you know, one of the things that, that I wondered was, we have all these different people from all these different uh, apart, uh, departments that will go to every single structure maybe five or six times in our community, and yeah, our community still can be very dirty. And so uh, we, we started to look at, well, how do we space our bus uh, stops? How do we do those kinds of things? We're getting, we were getting ready to build a new community center. The architect brought in the plans that were just horrible. And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, these things have got to reflect the community. Bring back something that is beautiful and relates back to this community that we're trying to inspire and elevate. And so I think that subtly it makes a huge difference. Um, what I would say to planners is, uh, and, I, and when I think about my, the, my planners that I have in my city, uh, don't be afraid to speak your truth uh, to the mayor, to the economic development administrator, because oftentimes uh, they can't picture it through your eyes. And so in some respects, you have to lend them your eyes and your perspective and teach. <laughs> and uh, so just think of it in that way. Doesn't mean that they will always go along, but oftentimes it's something that they'd never considered or saw or thought about in that way. And so you've got to understand how important your perspective is in informing the discussion. Um, first, I'd like to echo just my gratitude for the two of you to be here. Um, as a black woman, it's really great to see and hear from a panel of black women who are discussing the ways in which they're kind of pushing against the status quo um, and saying, no, uh, we already know that do that doesn't work, so we're going to do something totally different. Um, and as a first year student here at the law school, um, I'm really interested in addressing some of the biggest issues um, that are plaguing urban communities, particularly mass incarceration and poverty and violence using a human rights and critical race lens. 
Um, so for, um, for Mayor Weaver, um, I'm really actually interested in hearing a little bit more about how psychology um, plays in politics and policy as someone who also has um, a youth development mm -hmm. background. Um, and then for both Mayor Weaver um, and Mayor Harp, I am also interested in hearing the ways in which um, you're dealing with community cohesion and empowerment, specifically if there's any initiatives um, outside of the ones that you've already named, um, where youth are have a voice and have access to a seat at the table um, in developing what safety and healing looks like for their communities. Well, I would say uh, it was interesting because I remember even when I was campaigning, as soon as I found out about lead in the water, I had a press conference and um, I said, I'm really not having this as a candidate for mayor. I'm having it as a licensed clinical psychologist because I knew I had a moral and an ethical responsibility to speak out about the damage that I know lead has on, on young children and, and pregnant women. And so I, I did that. Uh, it helped me because it's easy for me to go out and speak about the mental health impacts. And so I was very comfortable doing that. Uh, but it also helped me when you have a community where trust has been broken, we, a community that's been traumatized, that's angry, uh, how do you deal with that and making sure that you let them have their voice? Uh, because people had a right to be angry. And you know, everybody's like, oh, you're so mad, they're so mad. Well, yeah, we are. And, um, and it's okay because it, there's nothing wrong with the feeling of anger, it's just what do you do with the anger? And so that was where it was, uh, I think my background helped because I said, you know, you can use your anger and be very productive or you can use it and not get things done or even be destructive. And I remember we were having a town hall one time and all the people from the state were there and, you know, we don't like them. So uh, they did a protest. It was kind of actually pretty creative. So anytime they talked, they would start, well, I have too much water in here but they would start crinkling these water bottles. And uh, you couldn't hear anything the people from the state, the EPA were saying. And uh, they didn't know what to do. And so finally I told them, I said, you know what? I said, I get it. I said, we're angry. I said, and, and, and you need to express your anger. I said, but, but don't do that right now. I said, because we want to hear what they have to say. Because we want to hold them accountable. We want it on record. We want to hear them. Because if we don't hear them, we can't hold them accountable for anything. And um, I, I said, and I also get that I've had opportunity to sit at the table with these people and say how angry I am. But the, the residents of the city hadn't had those same opportunities. And, it, and it's difficult because I had to, you know, people said, how was I going to even, how did I work with the governor? Well, they had all of the resources and they owed us. And that was what my responsibility was as the elected leader to work with whoever was in place. But um, I, I remember you know, telling him that, and, 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 and trying to explain to the people that while we're angry, you, know, you only have a window of opportunity for so long where people are looking at you or you can get certain things and our window may be this big but our anger may be this big and it doesn't match the opportunity so we can't blow it right now. We're going to have to use our anger and be focused on getting the resources that we deserve. Uh, doesn't mean that I'm in there, I'm not happy I'm sitting there with them. You know, we're not having drinks, having a good time. Uh, we're in there fighting a lot of the times. But we have to use our anger constructively. And so I was able to have those kinds of conversations and, and recognize how important it is to try and reestablish trust and know that we have to go above and beyond because so many things, you know, we've been in the news for so many negative things. And so this was like the straw that broke the camel's back for us. And, um, you know, just, just recognizing the importance of that. And like I said, for us to be able to get a chief public health advisor and talk about putting health in all policy, that's been very, very important. We, we talk about that. Um, it's like when people say, well, uh, what if we do this? It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's look at the health. And we've put health as the priority 
even though we've been a financially strapped city, because we know we got into this because uh, finances and profit were put over the health and the well-being of the people of the city of Flint. And so all of our decisions have to be health is first, and then we have to look at the finances. And so trying to come up with that balance is um, what we've done, but I think having a, a background in mental health really helped walking into the particular crisis that we walked into and having uh, been under emergency manager for so long and, and having a voice taken and recognizing the importance of what happens when you don't have a voice and other people make decisions for you. Well, I, I don't remember what your next question was. <laughs> <laughs> It was around community cohesion, I think. Oh, and uh, well, and that was that was a tough one. But you know what? I was I was um, we've had to spend a lot of time in the community, and, and and that's what we've done. And it's something you should do anyway. Mm -hmm. But you really have to do it. You know, like you said, you had a crisis with the with the um, epidemic, and and so you have to go above and beyond. And I think that's part of the reason we're out more. Uh, like you said, when you get home, it's nighttime when you come home because you are doing those kinds of things. And, you know, not only, I mean, on the radio all the time doing a show, going to block club meetings, going to schools and talking, going to the senior centers. Uh, I mean, just being out there in the community and engaging them. Uh, we, we've been working with, uh, we started something working with millennials about a couple of months ago, but trying to engage every single sector of the community is just really, really important and letting them know uh, that they have a voice at the table. It, it was funny, uh, when we started working with millennials, I said, they, we got a call from someone, he didn't know he was calling a millennial and leaving this message, but he said, Mayor Weaver must be crazy. She's talking to young people. Uh, you know, they don't do this, they don't work, they, you know, they don't go to school, they don't work, they just sit down in their parents' basement and smoke weed. I mean, just all these negative things. And, and I let them hear it. We, we, we taped that message and we let them hear it and say, so you need to be at the table. And here's why you need to be at the table. This, because people like this, that have these kinds of views, they're coming in here and they're, they're gonna vote and they're gonna make uh, their voices and their opinions known and make decisions about you. So you need to be here because you can't have those kinds of people making decisions for you. You need to be here making decisions for yourself. And you're also making decisions because these decisions we make, they're, they're there for five, 10, 15, 20 years. So they're about your kids and your parents. So you need to be part of this. And, and um, you know, working with people and doing those kinds of things but letting them know, and especially, you know, we said we know what it's like to not have a voice in Flint. You know, we had an emergency manager for six years. They, so the, the mayor has no power, the council has no power, they make all decisions. So come in here and let your voice be heard. And that's the message we're getting to people. So what, what um, we, I, I told you, we were, we're broken down into 12 uh, community management teams. Uh, one of the most oppressed and challenged neighborhoods that I, I do a lot of door-to-door -door when I run, um, I, I made it up in my mind that I was going to focus on that neighborhood. Right around the time I was first elected, uh, there was a burn grant application, and so we applied for a burn grant to really begin to organize and empower that neighborhood. Um, we were able to hire some people to do some things, but also because they had resources, that that actually helped to galvanize and build a sense of community. And the interesting thing that happened uh, with that management team and the other organizations that developed out of that, it's become a safer neighborhood. They've been able to demand simple things like lights. They have a lot of, we're, we're the Elm City, so there are a lot of trees and the trees cover the lights. So. Um, We've been able to really think about how do we um, actually have lower lights so that the streets are lit. Um, but they were so, they felt so empowered as a group that this summer they pulled all the management teams together and said, why don't we together come up with 60 free activity that family, activities that families can do in New Haven. And they had, a, a, it was called One New Haven, and they um, had all of these activities. They had a website, and there were places that families could go. And every single 
uh, community management team area. And so I think that that not only built cohesion for that community, but for our entire city. They have pledged to continue working on that throughout the year and to do more as we move into the summer. But one of the things that I did, you know, now, yeah, I went to planning school and, and all of that, and, but I was, I was the uh, Senate Chair of the Appropriations Committee. And so one of the things that I learned right away is that people become more engaged if ha they have money, even if it's a little bit of money. And so I was able to talk my Board of Alders into giving each of the management teams um, $10,000, it's not a lot, uh, for them to use in any way that they together thought was important. And it's really interesting to see what they together came up with in terms of projects for their communities. And some of them in the more challenged neighborhoods were able to get other dollars matched because of some of the problems that they might have. But it really has inspired a whole group of people that probably wouldn't have mm -hmm. been involved before mm -hmm. to come together, be involved, and fight over how they're going to spend this money. But they're doing it together, and it's creating cohesion, I think. So I can't think of a better note. <laughs> come back to what we call community justice and with this with this particular announcement, this question. I thank you for that question. That's really appropriate. Uh, I think I want to echo uh, the comment of how wonderful it is to have a panel of three black women uh, talking to us today. And I think uh, it has been more informative than we could have ever imagined. And I want to thank all three of you. And will you join me in doing so?